Um, if you haven't checked in yet, please use this link, fscheckin.classworks.com. We're doing a giveaway this year for a $100 Amazon gift card. Um, all you have to do is check in for any live session that you've um, been a part of so far. Just make sure that you submit it to us and we'll get you counted. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining our session. Hear from your peers. Um, we know, you know, educators are always looking to learn more from our colleagues. We attend conferences, you know, are members of professional organizations, frequently engaging in purposeful discussions. Um, and with the immense changes we have faced since March of this year, education professionals are learning from each other's strategies and successes even more now than before. While we're all working in slightly different circumstances, there's always a lot we can learn about how fellow educators are experiencing the similar challenges we all face. And today I'd like to share a couple of those perspectives with you. In our discussions with educators, we've identified four priority areas that we'll address in each um, or in our discussion today. And those areas are expectations and leadership, screening students, meaningful interventions, and asynchronous learning. Um, in today's session, we're joined by Rochelle Washington Scott, who is a principal from East Baton Rouge Parish School System in Louisiana, who has graciously offered to participate in today's discussion. Um, but we'll also be hearing from some other district leaders around the country throughout the session. Um, so if you have any questions for either myself or for Rochelle, please feel free to use the chat box to type them in. And if we don't get to them during the session, we will definitely make sure to address them at the end. Um, but let's get started by getting to know a little bit more about our guest and her district. Uh, Rochelle, would you give a quick overview of um, your site, your district, and maybe some of the challenges that are associated? Hello, and yes, once again, thanks for having me. Um, as you stated, we are from East Baton Rouge Parish School System, which is located in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And our school system is a relatively large school system, actually one of the largest school systems in our state. We house over 119 schools. Um, and within those schools, we have about 61 um, elementary locations. We have, I think it's 24 middle school locations, 20 high school locations. Intertwined with those are some of our public charters, which are also some of our district charters, um, as well as our traditional public schools. We have several magnet schools as well that are housed in the district. Our district is about 89% African-American students um, that, are, that are here in our area. As far as my school goes, I am actually an alternative uh, elementary school, which means for our location is we receive students from all of the elementary schools in the parish that are either suspended, expelled, overaged, or they have an IEP that is an emotional disturbance um, IEP um, as their um, as their, uh, their their issues or their concerns. So we have a melting pot of children that come here all throughout the year from the beginning of the year to the end of the year we can have anywhere from 50 to 100 different students that we encounter um, at one time the students i have in december i may not have in may the students i have in may i may still have them in august so um, it is a wide range of activities that take place and intertwining children that come that we have access to here um, and the chat, of course, that's the main challenge is that we are so transient. Our population uh, is always changing. The demographics of the children are always changing. Um, sometimes we get straight A students who just messed up one time and they get sent to us versus the students that are three and four levels below in reading and we still have to service them. So definitely a wide spectrum of um, issues that we encounter with our children. But like I tell everyone, I believe children are children. And that's the one <laughs> constant that doesn't change when they come to us. And so Classworks has definitely been a phenomenal piece in assisting us with kind of bridging those gaps. Um, when we get children from so many locations, we don't often parallel to the instruction that is taking place in the school system. Because like I said, there's 61 
one elementary schools um, that we're talking about. Um, and so for us, Classworks has done an, um, been an amazing part of our schedule, whether it's been interventions, whether it's been being a part of our class routine, whether it's just, it's just a part of our schedule, as I like to say, it's a part of our culture, it's the way we do things um, here at the alternative school location. So it has definitely been um, an added bonus and an added benefit. We do implement both ELA and math um, into our intervention piece as well as into our core instruction. Um, and, and we also pull in the science um, and the social studies reading components um, as needed, kind of based on a teacher by a teacher base. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. Thank you for sharing, Rochelle. Um, it sounds like you guys have implemented a really effective system. Um, and something that we get asked a lot about is where do we even begin when it comes to Classworks? And there are usually several answers depending on what the district's particular situation might be. But no matter what circumstances a district could face, strong leadership and clear expectations definitely set the tone for any implementation. Paul Brown is a principal in Atlanta Public Schools Martin Luther King Middle School, and I want to share his experience setting up a framework for success. So let's take a listen real quick. A lot of that discussion Better? happened. I think class work right, came thank out. You. We did a classwork uh, workshop with teachers. I had my instructional coaches to call Classworks and say, hey, what do we do? How can you help us? Here's how we're gonna do it. And uh, they, built a they built a professional development for us that was recorded where my coach was interacting with the facilitator and we actually pulled a teacher in, asked questions. And so we used that platform to help other teachers as well as we had our instructional coaches to meet with our teachers and to develop the mini lessons. And so we decided that lessons should last no more than 30 minutes, but within the 30 minutes, students should be able to complete their assignment. And we even talked about what days you would go live and what days you would not go live. During the schedule time three weeks, we built professional development time uh, into our schedule. So there were certain times that we, were, we had distance learning professional development for teachers where we were actually extending the lessons. Um, a big component was having our um, instructional coach work with the platform like Classworks to help develop those lessons. So Rochelle, this is an area in which you also excel. Um, how did you go about setting expectations when it came time to implementing Classworks? I think for our location and just for me as an administrator, I'm very big about not just adding another thing to the to-do list. And so for me, it was very important to get the teachers to buy into the fact that this is a part of our instructional day. This is something that we are using, um, not just because it's a mandate, not just because it's another program, but because this is what we're going to use to help bridge the gap academically for our students. And so the first thing that I have them to look at is definitely the data. When our students actually come to a, the campus, they actually go through a screening process. And a part of that screening process is taking the universal screener for Classworks. But we also look at a lot of the other factors um, that have sent the children to us. So for example, we have a, a district screener that kind of we correlate to Classworks and see, does it match? Does it flow? Is it saying the same, the same thing? And so what that does is it allows the teachers firsthand to to see on paper what it is that our children are struggling with. And then we can say, okay, now look at Classworks and this is how it can help to assist us with um, bridging and, and with bringing the kids to where they need to go. A lot of times, because we're the alternative school, we don't have enough certified teachers who are experts in every area. So I may have only two of my teachers who are amazing in math and two that are amazing in reading. And so what Classworks does for them is that it gives them that little bit of a cushion. So that way they don't have to come up with so much of the brain work um, because classwork does the, the work for them. It lets us know where the child are. It, it builds the individual learning plan. And so for our students and for our teachers specifically, 
once I sell it that way, it's kind of like, look, this is something to help you as an educator. This is not about me giving you more work. This is, look, this is how it works. I even model it um, for them. As a matter of fact, when our children first get into the program, the teachers actually get to see me kind of get the kids on board and get them excited. And I'm even, we're virtual and hybrid also. I don't think I mentioned that. But in our district right now, due to COVID-19, we have half of our students coming to school, half for our kids are at home. So literally everything is managed from the virtual platform, even for our children that are here. So the first face they get when it's time for classworks or any of their interventions for that matter is the principal. And so I get on and I'm like hype about it. And I'm like, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is how you log in. And so what that does for the teachers, it makes them feel like, hey, man, if my principal can get on here and do this, and she has a thousand other quadrillion things to do, then this must, you know, Know, be effective. And then also they get to see the progress almost immediately. They get to track. And that's one thing about, uh, I believe, teachers, they want to see that what you're doing is working and it's beneficial. Um, so for us, it was, a, it's like, a, it's teacher buy-in is definitely a major factor for me from the onset, as well as students. Um, the students, once they know, hey, we have a goal, this is where we're going. And they can see it because they can track their goals. They log in. They like to see their little pop-ups that lets them know that they're doing a great job. We print out their uh, their uh, their little certificates, and they're like, "Hey, we did it!" You know. So a lot of things that that we do um, that actually we didn't have to do the legwork for it. It's built in with Classworks. So Classworks kind of sells itself if you have the right cheerleader, uh, which I just think of myself as the cheerleader behind <laughs> behind it. So um, so yes. So I, I think I think that would be uh, in a nutshell um, how. How uh, I build and buy in, and what factors and goals we look at for our students. That's great, and that's a really great segue, actually, into our next topic, which is screening all students. Um, you know, after we have a plan in place and some clear expectations from our leadership about how classwork should be used, um, it's time to dive in. And for most districts, that starts with screening. Um, and as many of our audience is aware, Classworks uses assessment data to pinpoint exactly which skills students should work on. Um, many use partner assessments like NWEA MAP or Renaissance STAR, and some use our very own NCII validated screener. Gail Robertson is a curriculum director for Georgia Cyber Academy, and they're a campus that operates online, and they really are experts when it comes to digital learning. So I want to share how they began the process of getting started with Classworks in our next clip. I think one of the big things that I would tell um, districts that are looking at how do we provide virtual interventions would be to build your virtual intervention program very similar to what a traditional brick and mortar school does. So start with those basics, start with those screeners, screen your students in whatever screening or diagnostic tool that you have available. Um, it can be a state um, it can be a state assessment, it can be the milestones assessment, it can be a district specific assessment, but use whatever um, assessment you have built into your district to screen your students so that you can properly identify the students that need support. And then based on the number of students that you screen as needing additional support, that's kind of where you start building your program. So I definitely would recommend building your virtual intervention program very similar to that of a traditional brick and mortar program. Ask yourself questions like, would I provide these interventions during an extended learning time? And would this extended learning time be built into the student's schedule? And if that's what you would do in a traditional brick and mortar, then you do that in a virtual setting as well. So if you're going to use a model such as an extended learning time, you simply have a set, of, a set time designated during the day where those students that need tier two and tier three support come in and work with, whether it be an EIP teacher or an REP teacher or just a content specific teacher, but just that set aside time that they can work with those intervention specialists or teachers. So Rochelle, I know um, she mentioned some of the points that you had about using a district screener even and, and then using the universal screener. What's your approach to screening? When do your students receive the screener? So here we screen our students three times a year, beginning, middle and end, um, which constitutes uh, when they come to school 
in our winter and then at the end to kind of see their progress. And that is for all, for us, it is for all students. All students that come to our campus, they are required to take the universal screener um, because I also believe um, that even you can still use classworks for those students who are on level because it provides enrichment. And so what that does is our students who are in interventions, they are getting it at their level, but it's pushing our, our fifth grade students who may be able to operate at a sixth and seventh grade level um, to do some things that they wouldn't normally get due to the fact that we have limited staff for intervention purposes only. So those students sometimes are told you get to read, you get to do a book report or, or you know, whatever the nature um, of, of, of who we have on the campus during that time. So our students do receive the universal screener three times um, a year. They also are, um, we have a, a, a school-based assessment um, that we use as well for leveling them in reading and in math. And so they do do those as well as well three times um, a year. Um, and I don't know, uh, I'm sorry, what else was the other piece? Kind of got a little lost right there when you asked me that last No, that question. was, you, but <laughs> you hit the nail right on the head. You okay. hit the nail right on the head. Um, and this is actually another great segue, um, you know, because she spoke about ELT and IEPs for students into our next section, which is, which is interventions um, and a little bit of SEL too. So, you know, once students have been screened, they can really begin working. And this is where we can see how the RTI process comes together. So aside from the individualized learning that takes place, teachers assign those standards-based whole group lessons to echo what the students are learning in class. And this really allows the students to work at their own pace on their individualized learning, and then also not be the bottleneck for teachers when it's time for whole group or small group instruction. Um, I know in our last conversation, you mentioned that teachers use the paired reading passages and the differentiated math instruction kind of alongside the learning paths. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, definitely. So as you mentioned, um, when you were talking about IEPs, our school, actually, we house uh, what we call ED classes, which are students who have IEPs, as I said earlier, um, that are um, behavior kind of disorders um, that are attached to them. And so on those IEPs, there are specific goals um, that the teacher has to address in what we call resource classes or resource pullouts um, that they have to address with the students, in addition to the other interventions that are simply based on them being leveled. And so what our teachers have been able to do is to pull passages um, that are offered through Classworks based on the level of the child and still address the skill that is needed for the IEP purposes. Um, so for example, if, if they're focusing on main idea and I have a fifth grader and that particular fifth grader is reading on a second grade level, I can still address the skill of main idea that is on the passage, but I can go to a second grade passage and I can have the child practice fluency in reading at their level so the child can feel successful and so we're meeting the child um, where they are. Oftentimes we see that uh, when we have mandates to teach on level instruction we have children who get lost in the midst of the shuffle because they don't have the capacity to read and so we're judging their fluency against comprehension or their fluency against do I get the skill and so what class works and those pair passages and the differentiation even in the math piece allows us to do is say, this is where the child is and this is where we need them to go. So these are the steps we're gonna to take to get them there instead of just having this one size fits all approach. So the teachers have been loving it. Um, it's been very exciting. Even um, the integrated science passages have been amazing um, because a lot of times when we have children who cannot read, we forfeit science blocks in order to get them caught up in reading and get them caught up in math. So those integrated science reading passages gets them exposed to the content even though they might not get the full class time for science so it, it's been exciting that's great thank you and thank you for the shout out to our science content too i know we usually get math and reading you know the teachers are all over it but um it's nice to hear some good things about science as well so um you know after the students have been working on those assigned skills the teachers now want to know, you know, how the students are progressing, you know, are we going towards grade level mastery? And the Classworks progress monitoring is a super valuable tool for them. Um, once you assign progress monitoring probes to students, they'll be given quick formative checks each week at the grade levels they're receiving the intervention at. And the object here is again to see if the students are responding to the intervention that they're being given and if they're approaching that grade level readiness. 
So as you can imagine, this is incredibly powerful for tier three and special ed teachers and students. Um, Dr. Misty Freeman is the special education supervisor in Houston County Schools, Alabama. Um, I want to show her or I want to give her take on how she uses Classworks for progress monitoring. Currently, we have the progress monitoring that we do weekly. And our goal is for our students to spend at least one hour a week on, a, on their subject of weakness. That's our goal. However, we prefer that they spend at least three hours a week on their goal of weakness. We're really trying to implement classwork to make sure that we are aware of where our students are. Being able to identify the interventions that are working best for our students, that is so important. And we can automatically have the scores in real time. The students know exactly where they are. We have data that lets us know exactly how our students are doing. We also have the observation information that lets us know how the students are doing in class and as far as behavior. We can compare the information and see what the common factor is to try to help that student improve. So special educators have a unique learning environment as it is, and being virtual can definitely seen, be seen as a curveball. Um, but Classworks can help you customize instruction to meet IEP goals and make things more cohesive for your special educators and students. Rochelle, you were just talking about this. Um, Walker County is another special, uh, another rural district in Alabama that uses Classworks for special education. Um, so I now want to pivot over to them and, and take a listen to what their assistant superintendent and their special education director have to say about Classworks specifically for special ed. I believe Classworks is a very valuable tool for, for many reasons. Specifically for special education, Classworks is a, a very valuable tool because it meets the needs of uh, multiple areas of, of content where we have students who require um, specially designed instruction in multiple areas, not just one. Um, and then it, it also is a tool that they can use at school and at home, so there's continuity. I was talking with a teacher the other day about Classworks. She loves Classworks, uses it every day in her classroom and with her remote learners. And she was talking about how you can take uh, an outside program like STAR and you can assess students through STAR and STAR will automatically upload into Classworks so that she can use Classworks to progress monitor. Uh, she can use Classworks to differentiate with her students and also to build a learning path from the data that is inputted through Classworks. The learning path can be built for each student and meet them where they are. I think that data that we receive, you know, as they work through their learning path provides special education teachers with the, the resources and support when they're holding IEP meetings, when they're making decisions about what goals are needed in the IEP um, and what progress the student has made throughout the year. A schedule for uh, one particular student who may receive the majority of their services in the general classroom may be that their services be provided through Classworks and that their special education teacher is facilitating that and monitoring, having those discussions um, to, to see how that student is improving and progressing through the program. Then we have other students who may need more support that they're working um, as a pull out structure where they're coming to the resource room, working with a special education teacher or a special education paraprofessional to assist uh, through the program. And then we have uh, some who are working on that completely remote at home. And again, uh, the special education teacher is facilitating the content and monitoring the progress to determine if there's changes or, or anything, any conversations that need to be taking place. So she mentioned um, IEP meetings, and I know having things be virtual now, those have kind of changed. You know, they're an important part for ensuring students, teachers, and parents are all on the same page when we work towards student goals. Um, so Rochelle, how has the change in learning environments changed the way IEP meetings take place in your district or school? Um, specifically in my school, it's allowed the teachers to have a one-stop shop, <laughs> as I like to call it. Um, what has happened for our teachers, especially in lieu of 
virtual learning and meeting the expectations of the IEPs through virtual learning taking place, our district has upped our compensatory services requirements, which for most schools means more paperwork. Well, for our schools, because for our schools, should I say, uh, as well as our middle and high school who's also using Classworks, we are able to actually go into one system we're able to put documentation into the system. We're able to progress monitor through the system. We're even able to notate in the system, hence the academic and the behavioral note component that we can now put in for observations. And so what that does for the teacher when we're actually in IEP meetings is that they can literally pull up the classwork screen that has the data, that has the observations, that has the tracking, and literally they can walk the parent through not only the IEP goals, but what the children are getting in interventions outside of um, the IEP goals? How are they scoring in, rel in relation to on-level instruction? And what are we doing for the compensatory services piece, which is a, a whole nother additional component that we are asked to, um, you know, to, to meet right now due to us not wanting to be in corrective action, of course, with the state. And so for us, our teachers are loving it. And they're feeling empowered because they don't feel overwhelmed with documentation. And 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 of course, me because I'm I'm a very work hard, work smart, not hard principal. <laughs> so for me, I'm not going to ask them to transfer that to a whole nother piece of documentation when we can simply print it, put it in a binder, print it to a, or download it to a PDF, put it into a, a, a Google Drive, what, whatever it is that we need to do to make it work. So it's definitely taken out a lot of the paperwork component um, of IEP meetings. And then our parents understand it. It's very, very parent friendly um, for those parents who might not be as versed um, in what is actually going on in the education system. That's awesome, Rochelle. Um, and then the last point we wanna go over today is asynchronous learning. So with students learning virtually, it can be difficult to get into a groove that keeps students engaged, um, keeps all students engaged, I should say. Uh, something that really took teachers by storm when things went virtual was how differently they had to approach virtual learning compared with in-class learning. Uh, when teachers teach everything from the vantage point of an in-class student, it's hard for the students learning virtually to keep up. So in response to this, some districts have chosen to allow asynchronous learning or rather design their day-to-day -day instruction around students accessing it at different times. So this is where teachers really rely on their learning management systems like Google Classroom and Schoology or Canvas um, to make learning more accessible for all of their students, not just the ones in class. So by using their LMS and asynchronous learning, students can work through their schoolwork at a pace that makes sense to them. And they don't have to worry about Zoom fatigue or Wi-Fi or device constraints. Um, and to give a better idea about what this might look like in, in, in practice, I wanna share a clip from Dr. Elizabeth Curry, who is the Assistant Superintendent, City, Super, Assistant Superintendent of Gloucester City Schools in New Jersey. It's a tongue twister. Um, and how they've organized their approach to learning. So let me switch over to her real quick. Suppose a teacher has 15 students and, and she broke her class into three groups. Group A is going, those five students are going to work with the teacher. Group B and C are going to work on classrooms. What they would do would be to minimize the, cl the Google Classroom, go log into Classworks, open it up, see what the teacher has assigned for them, work on that. She would say, come back in 10 minutes. When they're done their 10 minutes, group B comes back, group A goes, group C comes back, group uh, you know, A and B are working, C is working with her. And it rotates through like many stations or many subgroups. At the same time, the teacher has the capacity to look on the window on the side to see who's logged into Classworks and who is not. So she can see, oh, okay, Johnny decided, he, I guess he went to get something to eat because he's not working in these 10 minutes. And when he comes back, she can say that too. So it's a way of monitoring. And the kids are very, our, our kids were used to that because we used that format when they were in school. So when they went home, the only difference was they were seeing their teacher's face in a little block instead of being in the same space with her. Because we use uh, a structure called Daily Five, which moves, which has direct in, introduction to a lesson, direct instruction, uh, practice as a group and then we break into smaller groups and we move around so in a 90 minute 
or 80 minute language block, there's enough time to do this. It was just a shorter amount of time. So Rochelle, I know that your campus pulls in Classworks instruction to Google Classroom for their students to easily access. Why do you feel like this is a valuable resource for teachers? Definitely a, a lot of similarities actually to what Ms. Curry um, just said in the video um, for us, um, because like she said, when you have those students that are virtual, you have things that do take place that can cause transitions to be off from those students who are actually on the campus. And so for us, our teachers do pull in uh, classwork into their Google Classrooms and they assign the students what it is that they want them to do. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a school-wide intervention block that takes place for 45 minutes every single day. So that is our drop everything. Everybody has to do those 45 minutes. And so that's automatically a sign. But what teachers do in their classroom is they align uh, an individual learning pathway to what the instruction is that is taking place even in their lesson plans. And so what this allows for us to do is the students will come on maybe 20, 25 minutes for what we call whole group instruction whether it be reading or math. And then based on the student's individualized schedule, they can get on and say, oh, now I need to do my, in, my ILP for my on-level instruction. And the teacher uses that to kind of monitor is what I'm teaching, are they getting what I'm teaching? Am I being effective? Do I need to reteach? Do I need to pull a small group? Whatever it is that's based on uh, the data that they get from how the students are progressing in the ILP for their on-level instruction. I think it's so valuable um, because it takes a lot of the management piece out of um, the teacher's hands and it puts the it puts the yeah, it puts autonomy on our students. One thing that we try to teach our students at the alternative location is for them to kind of take some ownership over their learning. Most of our students are here because they operate out of defiance. They operate out of, um, I just, I don't, I don't care about school. I don't want to be here. And so when you tell a child in the fourth and fifth grade, hey, you know what? You're only going to come to class for 25 minutes. And guess what? I don't care if you do your 45 minutes when you get off, if you do your extra time on the weekend, as long as you get your ILP is done, that's what's important. I have one student, she is an ESS student, she has an um, IEP. She actually ended up being our student of the year this year. Uh, for one of those major reasons is because literally she will go hard on the weekend doing her classwork. She comes back and she's done like about five hours and we're like, wait, what, you, what have you been doing? But it's because they're excited. They're excited because it's like, you know what? It's, it's not because I'm being forced to do it, but I see it's helping me. I'm getting it. I understand it. It's engaging. They love the videos. They love being able to interact. Um, I have even taken away our home homework policy here as far as pencil and paper and teachers are signing, they literally sign homework through Classworks because it's just something that is an effective way to keep our children engaged, to keep them wanting to learn, and they feel like it's not hard. It's something that they have the capacity to do. That's great, Rochelle, and congrats to that student who won student of the year. Um, I'm glad that Classworks could play a part in that. Um, so before we wrap up today, I, I just want to flip it back over to you real quick. Do you have any advice for our new Classworks customers or the people who are new to the Classworks fam going into the new school year? What advice would you give them? Um, I, I, I'm definitely one of those people that believe in less is more. And so um, for me, I, I speak, most of the time I speak directly to administrators because I believe that we're kind of the catalyst for everything that happens in our building. So definitely making it a point to provide teachers the time um, and the means to actually build in classwork into their schedule. You know, if you're going to adopt the program, you're going to bring the program in, give them the time that they need to implement the program. I also believe that you don't have to stack everything. So, so if you have um, on-level requirements, you have instructional minutes that you must master, find ways that you can incorporate classwork into that to kind of take the pressure off and then just have fun with it. You know, I, I just, my teachers, they, they do cheers and they're excited and they're motivated. They put it into their small group instruction. They put it into their workstations. They put it into their homework, wherever you can fit it in, fit it in. Because I, I will tell you this, if they do it, 
it assists them with growing. It doesn't matter if your students are doing it in a 45 minute block, a 20 minute every day, 30 minute every day homework piece. It just matters that they're doing it with fidelity. Um, and, and just, I mean, just go with it. I, I really don't think there's much that I can say until you actually get in it and you start making it work for you. I've been in uh, education for a long time. Instruction is my background. I, and matter of fact, reading instruction is my background. And so for me, I've seen plenty of interventions that we jump in, jump out, jump in, jump out. And the problem is we never do anything consistently long enough with fidelity to see it work. And so my thing is just keep working it, keep doing it, modify it. As, as needed and you're gonna see growth. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you so much for uh, helping out today. Um, so before I open up for some questions, I do have a couple of quick announcements. Um, you know, our all-star contest kicks off next week. Uh, you know, top 500 students with the highest time on task win big. You must have over 80% mastery. So from now for the next couple of months until it ends in the spring, we will be tracking your students' usage for you. We've also got some teacher social media contests and incentive contests. So definitely participate in. We love to reward you guys for your hard work and classworks and love to hear about the creative ways that you guys are using classworks. Um, and as another reminder, this is the remaining schedule for our fall virtual. Oops, Sorry, for our fall virtual summit, um, we've got two sessions to go tomorrow on special education that'll echo a lot of the points that we made today, um, talking about um, you know specialized instruction for special ed students um, and IEP goals and, and things of that. And then on Thursday, we have a what's new and what's coming. So you'll get a sneak peek at the new enhancements coming to Classworks this winter. Um, and then also five things you should know about Classworks. It's a great session. If you guys have a new district admin or are new to the Classworks family, this is a great session for you to uh, join to understand a little bit more about why Classworks was selected for your district and, and what it can really help you to accomplish. Um, so thank you so much, Rochelle. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. If you have any questions, please put them in chat or feel free to unmute. Thank you for sharing, Rochelle. You were wonderful. Hey, Michael, I've got a couple of private questions if we want to tackle those. Sure. Okay, awesome. So the first one is, do you provide res uh, parent, parent resources? Yes, we do, actually. So on our website, we have, um, we have a section for parent resources. We've got parent letters. Um, if you go to the Help Center, actually, um, or actually you should be able to access it right from the footer of our website. So if you go to classworks.com um, and scroll down to the footer, you'll see a link, uh, a link that says welcome parents and it'll provide some resources for you. Um, and it is right here. And you can access our parent letter that way. Also on our um, help center, so which is help.classworks.com, um, if you search parents, it'll show you the resources we have available for you there. So that's help.classworks.com. Awesome. And then the next one I have here is, if I need help strategizing for back to school, how can I contact you? That's another great question. So when you're logged into Classworks, um, you'll have your name in the upper right-hand corner. If you click down and click the link that says professional learning, um, you'll access our professional learning landing page. So you can also take a look at those options on our homepage on the tab that says professional learning. Um, you can schedule a Classworks Connect session. So this is a free resource for all of our customers. This is a um, 30 minute session. You can schedule with a Classworks success specialist. Um, this is the page that it, it puts you on when you access through Classworks and you scroll down about halfway through and you can select a date um, and a time that works for you and um, maybe a, a, another teacher if you guys have a, um, like a planning period or, or you'd like to, to tackle it together. Um, I have a question I see that came through. This question is directed for Rochelle. Um, you spoke about getting buy-in from teachers being important. What are a couple of ways that you've been able to gain interest from other teachers and get them bought into using Classworks? Um, first thing is, is definitely modeling what I expect them to do. Um, for me, as, as a leader, 
Um, I've always had more success when I show the teachers that what I'm asking them to do is doable because I can do it as well. <laughs> and so I'm, I just, I believe in going in and walking with them through the process, not just saying, hey, here's, here's the professional development, here's the presenter that's going to give you the professional development, not going to make it happen. I definitely believe that um, once they have gotten the professional development, this is year three for us using Classworks. So most of my teachers were here year one and two and received the professional development that was offered through Classworks. And so what we've been able to do just through that is we actually build in weekly ongoing sessions where we're checking in, we're seeing, okay, how is it working? Do we need to shift some things for you? Is this something with the students that the time isn't working? Um, for example, I have some students who just don't do well first thing in the morning, they're tired. And so our school-wide intervention block, unfortunately, is first thing in the morning. So being able to say, okay, it's okay. Johnny didn't do well in the morning morning, let's just switch it to the afternoon. So definitely letting them know that I'm right there with them in the process, letting them know that they do have some flexibility and autonomy, because there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to any type of instruction. Um, but especially when it comes to, to interventions, because Classworks allows for that. Um, and the other piece is taking away something from their plate. So what I tell them is, if you implement classworks with Fidelity, you don't have to do so much documentation um, or outside documentation because classworks brings it in. For most of my teachers, that's the ultimate buy-in um, because we come from a, a district that has so many varying um, requirements uh, here that if you tell them, hey, you don't have to do paperwork, you don't have to do the lesson plan for classworks, you don't have to blah, 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 whatever it is, they know that when I get on classworks, literally everything I need is on this particular platform. So I don't have to do anything else extensive. And I think for teachers, that that's most of, of the work. It, it is saying, I don't want you to stay late. I don't want you to have to be here till five and six o'clock doing extra assignments. This particular program is going to assist us with minimizing how much you have to do after hours. Great answer. Sorry, Simone, I think I cut you off when you when you were speaking. Um, was there was there another question you had? Yeah, no worries. There's just one more that I had. I think this is for Rochelle as well. Um, I think we tackled it a little bit. But the question is, what advice do you have for districts who are struggling to get started with Classworks? Just start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I, I, uh, at the district level, you definitely have to have someone who um, can go in at the school level and say, this is what we are going to do. I think a lot of times the reason why it falls at the district level is because there's no true clarity on how are we going to do it? who's supposed to do it, who's in charge of implementing it, and all of those pieces. Um, but as a district, the district has the autonomy to say, this is our intervention, and this is what we're going to do with our intervention. And so sometimes we can drop the ball um, at, at different tiers of leadership with that. But I think that's the biggest thing is just saying, okay, let's start with an intervention block, okay? If we have an intervention block that's built in, let's say even if it's only 30 minutes, if it's 45 minutes, two times a week, let's start with whatever intervention block you currently have built in for reading and math and let's implement classworks. So let's start there and let's start with fidelity. Can we do it? every intervention time. And so then gradually build upon that. I think sometimes um, at the district level, you don't always have people that understand instruction and interventions in trying to implement instruction and interventions. <laughs> so I think also, um, I don't know if Classworks has this, but but one thing may be to actually, you know, roll that out for them, like show them on paper, hey, this is what you can do as a step-by-step -step piece. You don't have to do everything at one time, but this is, this is the way that you can roll it out to be effective. So I think that would be my suggestion uh, from a district level. And then from an administrator point, it's kind of the same thing. It is if I have, I know I have to put interventions in somewhere. So if I have to put them in somewhere, however I have put them on my schedule, I know that's where I can start Classworks. That's great. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in on my end, but I'm happy to stay on for a little bit longer in case any more trickle in. Rochelle, again, thank you so much. This was amazing having you on with us. I know this is super valuable to all of our customers and I seriously cannot thank you enough for your, um, for your help. Thank you for having me. You guys are awesome.
Thank you. Um, also, guys, before we close out, I did put the link to the check-in again in the, the chat box. If you guys have not checked in yet, definitely go ahead and do that. We want you to enter to win our giveaway um, so we can give it away. So, all righty. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you all for attending. I um, hope you have a great rest of the week.